Despite Unfer's earlier insults and the failure of hunting, Beowulf graciously makes no comments about the failure of hunting that might damage Unfer's reputation. He says only, although hunting is hard-edged, I could never bring it to bear in battle. And later, when he returns the sword to Unferth, Beowulf tells him he had founded a friend in battle and a powerful help. He put no blame on the blade's cutting edge, line 1810. This shows remarkable magnanimity on Beowulf's part for his sword brother. Beowulf credits God with his victory and hands over the hilt of the giant's sword to Hrothgar. The king examines the hilt's engravings, which tell how the flood was God's judgment against the wickedness of giants, and, by extension, monsters and monstrous men. The poet says that the giants suffered a terrible severance from the Lord. The Almighty made the waters rise, drowned them in the deluge for retribution. These engravings tell the age-old story of the conflict between God and the monstrous descendants of Cain, who continually rebel against him. Notice the effect that this has on the story. The death of Grendel and Grendel's mother give two proofs that God does judge and destroy those who war against the peace and integrity of the community. Here the poet again overlays his Christian vision of the world on the pagan story. Why? In order to communicate how God was working behind the scenes, even in pagan times. In the archetypal struggle of hero against monster that fills Germanic myth, the poet explains that God gave aid to those who fought to protect hearth and home. The poet stresses that God is on the side of those who establish and preserve peace, and adamantly against those who try to destroy it, against both monsters and humans who act monstrously. This prepares us for the next section of the poem, which focuses more on the reality of the monsters within each human heart. Hrothgar again praises Beowulf for his prowess and success over the monster, but his exhortations to Beowulf are not purely adulatory this time. Hrothgar contrasts Beowulf with Hermod again, just as the Shope did after Beowulf defeated Grendel. But this time, Hrothgar also uses Hermod to warn Beowulf about the danger of pride. Hermod's pride corrupted him, awakening greed. He stopped giving treasure to his thanes and became dragonish with his gold hoard. Eventually, line 1714, he killed his own comrades, a pariah king, who cut himself off from his own kind. Finally, his pride leads directly to his death when his own men betray him into an enemy ambush. For fans of Tolkien's Hobbit, Thorin Oakenshield's gold lust nearly led him into the same fate as Haramod. It is very likely, in fact, that Tolkien, a great scholar of Anglo-Saxon language and literature, structured the episode of Thorin in The Hobbit with the story of Hermod in mind. Looking at the speech that Hrothgar gives, it seems that the Danish king feared that Grendel and Grendel's mother have distracted Beowulf from the monsters that lie within him in seed form. So he mixes his praise with admiration. In line 1759, Hrothgar says, Choose, dear Beowulf, the better part, eternal rewards. Do not give way to pride. For a brief while, your strength is in bloom, but it fades quickly. Trust not in strength, but in wisdom, Hrothgar says. Pride and strength and glory are fleeting and fickle. Wisdom is eternal. He also warns Beowulf that success in battle can lull him into lowering his guard and letting pride take root. An element of overweening enters and takes hold while the soul's guard, its sentry drowses, grown too distracted. Lines 1740 to 43. Men who lower their guard over their hearts, Hrothgar says, are stalked by a demon archer who shoots arrows of pride. So Hrothgar warns Beowulf never to lower his guard over his own heart, no matter how successful he becomes. O flower of warriors, beware of that trap. Do not give way to pride. Beowulf hears this lesson and was elated when gladly obeyed the old man's bidding. Hrothgar's warning has landed on fertile soil, as we will see later when Beowulf recounts his fight with Grendel for his own king, Hyalak. Instead of a play-by-play account, Beowulf glosses over the whole thing. He tells his king, It would take too long to tell how I repaid the terror of the land for every life he took, and so won credit for you, my king. Surely Beowulf has the makings of a good king. 
As the feast begins in Herat, the poet tells us that soon all was restored, the same as before. Happiness came back, the hall was thronged, and a banquet set forth. Black night fell and covered them in darkness. Because of Beowulf's victory over the monsters in the dark, the Komitatus has been completely restored. There is nothing to fear in the Black Knight anymore, as long as every warrior guards his heart and remembers his loyalties to the king. <laughs>